good evening. Um, we should go around and do our introductions for the camera and so on. Do you want to start? Sure. I'm Sheila Linton from Brattleboro. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm representing myself as well as the Root Social Justice Center. Uh, Don Stevens uh, from Shelburne, and uh, I represent the Nolhegan Avenue Tribe. Gary Scott, I'm a lieutenant with the State Police. Jeff Jones from Moncton, Vermont. David Chair with the Attorney General's Office. James Pepper, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. And Eitan Nasred and Longo, I'm Chair, and I use he, him. Thank you. Uh, okay, moving right along. Oh, now wait, you. I'm sorry. I'm staring at the little box in the middle of the table. Go ahead. I'm Mayor Jones with State Police, and I am um, the designee for Commissioner of Public Safety. Great. Thank you. Sorry. No problem. Uh, I, it's hard to get used to the computer age where little boxes are people. Um, <laughs> so, the minutes. There have not been a lot of moments or minutes, one could say, between the last meeting and this meeting. So the minutes from the last meeting are not yet prepared and ready to be disseminated. So that's why I don't have written there what I usually have, which is approval of the minutes, because you don't have them yet, so there ain't gonna be any approving them. And at the moment, given how many people we have here who were actually at the last meeting, it would be a little strange because there'd be two of us, three of us, right. who would be approving the minutes. So I'm actually kind of glad that we don't have them and we can, we can put that off and have two sets of minutes to look at next month. Um, that's all I needed to say about that. Um, sorry about that, but um, there were some unavoidable things that came up and beyond my control and our control, and there it is. Announcements, anybody have any? I will go last. Anything? Um, I would just say that Fair and Impartial Policing quarterly meeting for BSP is coming up next Monday night at the law school. That's right, that's right. 5.30 pizza, six o'clock. Policy making. So Round. there it is. Um, the regrets I got for this evening are that, well, um, Chief Don thought he'd be late, but he wasn't. And uh, Judge Grierson didn't think he'd be able to come. He has some commitments that he has to see to. Poor Monica Weaver has the evil cold that has overtaken all of the Northeast. Um, so she will not be here. Those are the regrets that I've gotten. Obviously, there are more. <laughs> um, but we'll do with what we have. Um, I gave out to everyone this bill that came to me. They come to me in a very haphazard <coughs> fashion. There are certain plants that I have who very kindly send them to me so I actually know what's going on, as I don't really have the time in my life to spend on the legislative website that I'd like to have. So this one came across. Do you have that, Sheila? I do. Okay, good. I, that's right, you asked for it before. I'm like forgetting things already. This is a uh, H381, an act relating to racial impact statements. I thought it would be important to put this out to everyone because this came up at our last meeting when Robin Joy was giving us um, her, her um, take on data collection, which certainly was difficult in some ways to hear, although very honest. Um, and one of the things that came up and actually yeah, you were part of that. We were talking about data impact statements. Uh, I'm sorry, um, racial impact statements. 
being something that might be good. I cannot remember, and I need to look at the minutes when they come out around this, whether um, Robin Joy herself brought it up or what. But I, but that, I remember that being an issue that somehow racial impact statements would be a way of keeping the notion of personal bias in the front of people's minds and that being an issue that we all thought was important. So when this came across my desk or computer, I thought I would bring this up to the notice of the entire panel. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what I want for a response or if I particularly want a response. If you have a response, we'd love a response. But I thought that it would be important just to show it to you because, as I say, this came up last meeting. The, I underlined, not on your copies, but on mine, uh, a few lines. On the first page, lines 11 through 13, this bill proposes to require the Office of Legislative Counsel to prepare a racial impact statement on certain proposed legislation. Um, on page two, lines six through 11, that would be a subsection B in section 130, uh, 431. Racial impact statements are tools to guide policymakers in proactively assessing how proposed sentencing initiatives impose racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system. Similar to fiscal and environmental impact statements, they provide legislators and state agencies with a statistical analysis of the projected impact of policy changes before legislative deliberation. Um, I, the way this was supposed to work, on, or is supposed to work, when it, if indeed it is um, passed, uh, it, page three, section 433, subsection B, the racial impact statement shall be made available to the committee prior to a vote on the bill resolution or amendment, and then there's what it should include, which takes up more space. Um, on the last page, the significant part for me, um, beginning on line 10, subsection D, if the General Assembly finds that a bill, resolution, or amendment has disparate impact on members of racial minority groups, the author of the bill, resolution, or amendment shall, one, offer an amendment to the bill to reduce the disparate impact of the legislation on members of racial minority groups, or two, provide for the members of the body in writing his or her reasons for advancing the legislation without amending the disparate impact of the legislation on groups, on members of racial minority groups. That's it. I just thought we should know about that. I, I don't, you're making an interesting face. Well, I'm wondering how, when they say that, if they know it's going to impact minorities, if they knew that, we wouldn't be in the situation we are. Interesting so my, point. My question is, how are they going to determine, or who is going to determine, if it impacts minorities? I mean, I have another uh, concern, uh, which is inherently weird, like on the page where it says, Native Americans who have origins in any Indian tribe of North America before 1835. What it just new American tribes just pop up? I mean, I mean, I don't understand what that means. So does that mean only you know that are on federal rolls? Does that mean? I mean, uh, we got recognized in 2011. Does that mean we're excluded from any of this uh, within the state? I mean, that's just that's inherently biased right there. I mean, within the state of Vermont, so that means that we can't we're not legally a minority if you look at the statute. It says we are. Okay. I mean, so I'm just Good. saying there are some things in here. There are that, some things. I mean, I'm just looking at this for the first time. And yeah, no, know. and that's, I, I didn't expect people to have, you know, fully <laughs> formed responses to it, but I just thought we should start with it at yeah. some point. And um, my only other thing is all of these bills that are being introduced, this seems like there's been a flurry. Uh huh. Who, who is combining these or, or vetting these as a totality? Because like the one that was for the AG, creating a new working group that kind of circumvented what we're doing. And then, I mean, there's like all these things coming in play, even like, I think there's Mark Hughes even submitted yes. one. So there's like, there's like a whole bunch of them kind of almost like they're either overlapping, competing interests or how, I don't even know how this is happening. It, it, it is a bit, 
it is a bit confusing because I'm feeling like a lot of these are initiatives that we're sort of commenting on and have been working on commenting on and people are writing bills already <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, that's done. I'm not sure what our role is at the moment. Well, but part, Yeah, because part of our charge is to recommend one central location for data collection and all that, but yet even this has to do with collection and other things. So I'm just, I guess I'm a little... What do we do? I, well, I'm a little confused about how this is all, there's no sense of like there's any coordination at all. Definitely yeah. it's not. Mm -hmm. I mean, so how do we, how does all this stuff impact each other? I mean, I don't That's it's, a good question. I'm, I'm wondering myself. And how is it being vetted through the communities of color that are being mentioned here? Because like what you're saying right here, right. put a big X, like I'm like, so were you at the table when this, these no. four lines were created? Right. No, I didn't you know, even know this any was your people? Well, Exactly, this is, so how, this is, how are we yeah. in this without even being asked? Like. Like, this doesn't even make sense. And I'm reading who's at the top of it. You know, one of one my legislators, my actual legislator right. is at the top of this um, document. But how are people speaking on, on behalf of us that aren't part of that community and making up legislation that is either incorrect, outdated, or doesn't um, represent the people in a correct manner? That's, and not organized, like they said, with all the other legislation that's coming out. We, there are some big questions, and I'm, I'm going to get on that. I don't know what I'm going to be able to do. I'm saying that very bravely, but yeah. And the other one that I had was exactly what you were expressing, Chief, about who decides this, who's deciding yeah, that there's a racial, I mean. Where did they come up with 1835? I mean, what, I don't even know. Right. I'm like. It's got to be from the census. That's and it's, it's, just, it's just plain offensive anyway, because it's just still the, um, it's still repeating basically the sentiment that you are all not people. And, and that goes again, too, with providing the proper documentation. My issue is, is that, I mean, that's like, if you, if you go up to an African-American community and say, let me see your papers. Yeah, right? you know, it would be I'm, I'm just saying as we had to, we're the only race of people that have that can't self-declare. Right. Mm -hmm. We have to prove who we are in order to get recognized. So if we are part of a recognized tribe, then obviously then we are recognized. <laughs> right. You know. So I'm just saying is is that I don't even know like proper papers. I mean, do I don't even want to. Yeah. This whole thing, I don't even want to. I yeah. mean, we should be included. I'm glad they at least have Native Americans <laughs> will be included. I mean, that's, that's yeah. right. <laughs> Sometimes we don't need to be at the table. I mean, there I was, are certain things that we can... I was actually nice to see that because we are often forgotten. I mean, mm -hmm. but, but, uh, but, yeah, that, yeah. Hey, Tom, I'm sorry if I missed sorry. you saying this, but is this the um, bill that they asked for you to provide? No, no, that? this is new. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, this, is, this is one that came across my computer. Mm -hmm. Um, that I'm not, I can't remember who sent it because they're coming in really fast and furious at the moment. <laughs> but um, we had, remember, Rob and Joy had discussed yeah. exactly this issue. And I got on it and went, oh, that's a great idea. And you and I were sort of having a little moment when we were sitting there about, talk, about the <laughs> idea of racial impact statements, keeping that, you know, keeping people's bias mechanisms at the front of their minds and such. Mm -hmm. remember, do you remember that last meeting that we were having? Vaguely. You do? Okay, well, I, I was really appreciative of that, but so I thought that when this came across, I should bring it up to the to the panel, yeah. because this is something that came up on the 26th of February. Um, just for the record, uh, I apologize for being late. I appreciate all of you who drive to Waterbury every month, because I cannot get here on time. Um, I'm Jessica Brown. Um, I think Rebecca is on the phone. Rebecca oh, cool. started texting me um, like while well, I was 10 minutes away, and she is at the library in Waterbury. So oh. uh, hopefully she is at least hearing this. Um, but I feel like there was a bill that um, one of the bills we talked about last time, she mm -hmm. was our boss at the Defender General Office had asked her to look into as well so I don't, oh. she might be on mute but Rebecca if you're there and you want to say anything about any of these bills this is H381 yeah. hello I am here and um, can you hear me yes, yes. oh good good I am here and I do apologize I 
I need your focus on the details. And I wasn't <laughs> just been traveling. It's been a long day. Um, I do not. I missed the. Can someone just tell me what bill you guys are referencing, Chief? You were talking about and, and reviewing a definition. Well, what what bill is that? H dot three eight one. And uh, and Aton, you'll forward that on to the rest of the group. Sure. Yes. not going to be here tonight. Or David Schur or James Pepper, anyone else would be at the legislature who would be aware of this. I know ACLU is pushing forward a data collection bill, um, and I know that they were working closely with the sponsors on that. We were not behind that. I don't know if they're in the room to explain it a little bit more. Um, I, it sounds like then there might not be anyone in the room who is... Well, well David and Pepper are both, are both here. Well, Pepper has something to say, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I can provide just a very brief bit of context of this bill in particular. Oh, good. Uh, because I was at the Legislative or Democratic Caucus when the lead sponsor, and I don't believe it had any other sponsors at that point, just introduced this. It was in about a 10-minute uh, segment where all the, anyone who had a new bill that week said, hey, this is the bill, this is what it's supposed to do. I'm going to pass it around this sheet and you can sign up as a co-sponsor. And so a lot of folks, when that happens, and I'm not saying that happened in this bill, mm -hmm. they don't read it, they hear the concept, they like it, they want, they think through the legislative process, they'll be able to fix the problems with it. Um, and uh, as far as the idea that there is this flurry of bills and there is very little coordination, um, that is true. There's no barrier to uh, seeking a bill or putting your name on a bill and introducing it, having referred to committee. Um, I would say that uh, to the extent that they're kind of usurping the role of the uh, Racial Disparities Council, I don't think that that is true. I think that there is a lot of um, excitement about the proposals that this committee is going to put out and that a lot of this other stuff, you know, they might be, who, who knows how, why they're motivated or, but um, they, this is seen as the expert panel um, and we've had conversations, um, or I've had conversations in both the House Judiciary and the Senate Judiciary, kind of updating them informally on the work that we're doing um, and just saying that, uh, you know, we intend to come out with recommendations um, uh, related to the report that we're required to re re release. Um, and I think that there is actually a lot of excitement, and there would be a lot of excitement, which you've done already, to come in and kind of update people on the progress of the committee. Um, because I think there is a lot of uh, momentum okay. right now that uh, people want to do something okay. to address racial disparities. And as uh, Rebecca Turner mentioned, there is an ACLU bill. Um, it doesn't look like it's going to quite make the kind of deadline mm -hmm. um, for this year. Uh, but there is, I know, I've been told that there is going to be a discussion about that okay. bill, and it's a, it's largely a data collection bill. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Uh, Saturday we've got an ACLU meeting, board meeting. Okay. And I can forward anybody's questions about that particular bill. Uh, Representative Rachel said, of course, 
will be there as well. Okay. So if anybody wants to fire me an email, I'll, I'll pass Great. it on. Great. Okay. And I, Thank you. And I have one statement, as Chief Stevens, one statement, one concern. The statement is, is that now there's two panels. Now there's our panel, and now there's the racial advisory panel, too. So there might get some confusion going on because that's a different panel doing some of the stuff. I know we're dealing with criminal juvenile justice, but that's kind of overall arching uh, support to the new executive director whenever that happens. Um, the cons the, this is a legal question or concern for you, David and, and Pepper. Um, if a bill like this one would have gone through and passed, where it's defining minorities, is it restricted to this bill or does it change? Like, like in 2006, we were given minority status. Abenaki people were given minority status, right? That was in 2006. So if for a reason this said, this, they're, they're defining what a minority is, so does that change? Like, does that then over, does that then discount? what we pass in the other statute, or is it just referring to this bill? Because, I mean, there's some legal ramifications of what bills can affect. May not so much, maybe it's narrow, narrow to us, but I'm saying all of a sudden they could erase somebody from being a minority by just, yeah. I and, mean, and we worry about that. that. Yeah, that, that I worry about that a lot when we mess with definitions and bills. And, and what, what ledge council, legislative council tends to do is they try to limit it, the in, impact, as you can see on page two, line 13, as used in this subchapter, meaning subchapter six of right. TGSA 13. Right. So it would just be limited to this. this racial impact statement uh, but um, it is something where it, it's very you know you never know what sort of second and third order effects tinkering with definitions is going to have because I see a lot of times things added to our statutes that we weren't even aware of right. like for instance somebody goes through and says we don't want uh, electronic gaming all of a sudden that shows up on our bill and we didn't even know it got there or put into our subcategory that native people can't do electronic gaming. Where'd that come from? You know, I'm just saying is that stuff get added all the time and we're not even aware of it. So I just want to make sure to protect our interests. And I know I'm speaking on behalf of our people because well, we're in a different, well, we're in a separate, we're in a weird category because we are actually a government and we can't self-declare and we have to get a Euro-American government to say you are really Indian. So there's, there's a whole structure around that that's different than any other race. So we're in kind of one of these weird situations. And I just want to make sure that when these bills come through, that it, all of a sudden it doesn't erase the years and decades and that we've worked hard to get to where we are, I guess. And I don't want that because we're often forgotten. Like I'm saying is, uh, you know, people don't consider us a minority, even though we are. I mean, they don't look at us and say, oh, you're a minority. It would be like, uh, we're minority in statute, so legally we are, but people don't look at us in the same manner because of our color of our skin. Uh, it's just a fact. Yeah. So I just want to make sure that, I don't want to belabor it, but I, I, I have a real concern yeah. when it comes to this stuff, but nobody's vetting that piece of it either. David, you can. Yeah, I mean, I think a couple things. One, I think your concern is very valid, that um, this stuff, it, all the various issues aren't always considered when legislation is proposed or even when it goes through the process. And just by way of context, I would say, especially that initial stage of legislating, which the introduction of bills is complete chaos without any oversight. Anybody can introduce anything. And, and oftentimes it's really an expression of political desire or priority as opposed to a serious future law. Uh, and the expectation is that for those things that actually just get acted on, which is a minority of everything that gets introduced, um, that hopefully the legislative process will allow these issues to get vetted. You'll call on all the people who may be affected, all the groups who may be affected. In an ideal world, the legislative process irons out all these problems and would catch the issues that you're pointing out. We don't live in an ideal world. The reality is that things do get all the way through the system without these problems getting ironed out. But 
um, having spent a bunch of time in that building, uh, the legislative process is very chaotic. And so all of your concerns about seeing something, you're like, where the hell did this come from? Why didn't this? I mean, this happens all the time. It's a, it's a, it's a. Well, like, that's why I was asking. If part of our recommendations is maybe making sure that legislation, whether once it hits legal or whoever, gets vetted by the people. Like, there's no, there's really not a native person there that they can go to, right? That's the thing I've been complaining about for years. I mean, we have the VCNAA, but they're on a commission once a quarter. Once there's nobody that works in legislation or works at the state level all the time as a native liaison. I don't think there is right now of a person of color doing that. This that's what this executive director is supposed to do. But uh, I, I'm just I don't know if part of our recommendation I don't might be outside the scope, but I'm thinking. Maybe we should say there should be a process put in place where, since we are such a diverse uh, state now, that legislative affecting those individuals should be vetted through some body, you know, a policy could be created or something. Some workflow could be created to then make sure nobody's missed. I don't know if that's something we should think about that's yeah. part of our recommendation to the legislature. Because the, I mean, the irony is that the bill seems to exemplify the problem it's supposed to address. <laughs> yeah, that's, well, <laughs> um, and that's exactly what it's um, messing up. Right, yeah. and it's, it's getting it wrong. It's a good example of why we need to. Yeah, right. I mean, this is... Sorry. I, I would just say, just on an informal basis, I mean, this could be a part of a recommendation, but um, I Make would... Make sure to write it. Yeah, I would really recommend um, introducing yourself uh, to all the committee chairs and just saying, hey, listen, if there's something that impacts the Abenaki tribe. Most people know me. Yeah, well, yeah <laughs> I, I just want to be contacted. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, like, they'll do that. You know, yeah. they, sometimes, you know, some of these bills just, you know, you know, if it involves criminal justice, the same five people get called every single time. Yeah, and right. that's it. And then they hear from those five people, and then it's either yes or no. Yeah, I've been fortunate that people on committees say, hey, you want to testify or do you know anything about this? Yeah, you know, right. call me. But that's not always the case. Right. What? But anyway, that's, not, that's here nor there. Yeah. It's not a policy. It's kind of you're, you're hoping for them remembering that right. you exist. And that is the reality of how this stuff works is making the committee members um, need to know who they should be contacting. And I do think they are conscientious about wanting to hear everything. But, you're, but they sometimes just don't know. And you're absolutely right that having the presence there makes a big difference, and that's something that we need to think about. I have to say this process, because this is the first time I've gone through a legislative season and been chair of this. This is keeping me up at nights. I mean, I, I'm a little like, you know, and people keep r rattling off numbers to me, and I, like I know what's going on. And it, it's like, I don't know algebra I mean I'm, I'm like that's lovely um yeah I know all about it uh-huh um and I'm wondering I guess with this I'm glad I brought it up to the panel because there's been a lot around it I feel like it's a recommendation that we would want to make on in a perfect world about racial impact statements that doesn't seem like a problem correct me if I'm wrong um that just feels like something that ought to be down because we keep talking, or at least we were in at the end of February, about the need to keep bias and stuff at the forefront of people's minds, who uh, particularly people who are policy makers. This is a way of doing that, it seems to me. But it also seems to me that, and I don't know whether I'm if what I'm about to ask sounds like a question from a child, which it is. Um, it seems like we ought to be testifying about this. Yeah, I definitely should be. I don't expect this bill to come up this oh. time. Oh. Crossover okay, never mind. So. <laughs> crossover for non-money bills is the end of this week on the House and the and Senate next week. Yeah, I don't, I don't think this will be considered this year. Well, I've just wasted 45 minutes of not, everyone's life. Not really, because it still will go into no, committee. Yeah, you've still, still got next year that okay. come up, because it, 
this is not a biennial year, so any bills that aren't taken up right. this year will go stay in committee until next year. Right? That, that's right. So. Absolutely. And I also think the larger point remains that what you're saying about attention needing to be paid uh, in areas where it's not always paid, which speaks to bias also, right. is true for many bills. Yes. And so, and, and the... Uh, and I also want to echo what James Pepper said, which a little bit ago, which is that the Judiciary Committees in particular are very aware of this committee. Okay. So, um, yeah, they they are aware of it and want to hear from it, and so that I'd that love to. If they'd slow down, it'd be a lot easier. <laughs> not a forgotten entity. Okay. It's not a forgotten entity. No, forget me. I don't care. Just do the work. <laughs> I, 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 it, it, it's, it's just this is a little dizzying. It is, and, it, it, and especially if you haven't spent time there, it's very hard to figure out yeah. what's really going on. Uh, okay. The reality of it, yeah. Anybody else? Um, I, what, does there something, somebody that we should, I guess we should just table it for right now. Well, go ahead. No, I was going to say my recommendation, Aton, is that as chair of this committee, I would reach out and say we have concerns with H.381 and bills similar please if they're coming up let us know so we could uh testify or address them i would i would at least reach out and say <clears throat> we have concerns about some of these bills if once it comes to the forefront we need to this we need to have a voice um i'm writing what you're saying yeah. especially you know and you can use the example that, I, that yes. I gave you too i mean it's like we're considered a minority in the state of Vermont by statute, and that kind of is con contrary to that. Right. Thank you. And I would even step it up a notch of talking about, about us being vetting. Everybody keeps saying everybody knows about us, but every time I hear us talk about us, nobody seems to include us. So I'm confused. It's, con it's contradictory statements that are being said consistently with this group. And I think that I personally, as a person who is impacted, would be impacted by this bill, that I don't want to spend time having to testify for something that should have never been created in the first place. So I'm concerned that this is a way for us, and disproportionately for us as communities of color, to have to be in the rigor and mortar of going all the way around and around and around for something that shouldn't even really exist for the reasons why we've even mentioned here. So I would love there to be more of a vetting process or something to when it comes right off the press and it impacts any of the issues that we're addressing, that those communities that are most impacted do get a call and that we are on the roll decks both as groups, organizations, or as individuals. Because I don't want to wait another month for this and then testify this committee, do this committee, that for what reason when this shouldn't exist in the first place in the manner that it is written right now. Got it. I think the only way to prevent something like this from even coming up is to have our own recommendations at the forefront and center and saying, hey, listen, this body is dealing with racial disparities. Don't, you know, as a one-off bill, do something that might be unintentionally harmful. Well, I'm not saying we need all of us to be in this. And so I'm not saying that people shouldn't be creating bills. I'm saying that they need those people who they were creating bills for to be at the table creating those bills with them or to be um, communicating with them and be in communication when that is happening is what I'm saying. It's great, but if this if this was to come to us, right? I mean, I don't know when this was written, but, um, you know, so let's say, okay, so last week maybe we should have gotten this so we can be like, oh, because like what you said, is these um, people who are co-signing to this, they, they don't know. They don't know what they don't know. So they're, they're thinking maybe... They're thinking they're helping. They're thinking they're helping. And so we would like to save them time and energy. I mean, right? Yes. Yeah. I want to save my own time and energy. And so why get down the line? Because we're going to be having the same conversations and be more, uh, more tension in the room down the line than if we just said, hey, you know what, here's what we're thinking yeah. about. We realize we didn't include you. We're going to include you next time. And then we realize, hmm, that's not such a great bill. Let's move on to something different. Yeah. I'm hearing, like, two different things. One is, well, they're forming as two different ideas in my brain right now. Um, one is that ultimately maybe part of our recommendations, whatever you know, form that finally takes, um, includes recommendations about who, like, how to involve um, people of color, um, members of 
define minority groups however they're going to be defined in creating any bills that are going to be proposed to address anything having to do with with those groups right. whether it's well particularly with regard to anything um, about the criminal justice system right. um, if the point of this panel is to specifically address criminal um, right. disparate impact in the criminal justice system um, but then also it seems like there could be a way to figure out you know I hear um, what Sheila's is saying in terms of like we don't want to get bogged down testifying at a bunch of hearings on bills that you know no one who's affected by them is involved in creating right. in the first place at the same time like now that we know that a lot of this is happening and we do exist i mean someone did ask you Aton, to yes. testify yes so it seems like at a minimum right now like they there should be some way to overlap a little bit with yeah. having someone from you know and right. in my opinion most, the most likely person would be you um at least be contacted and and right. rebecca did say that she is um you know in her capacity for the defender general right i mean the defender general is certainly uh a presence at the legislature every year yes and makes themselves heard on um any legislation re regarding criminal justice right. um so i feel like there are ways in the interim until we're presenting our official recommendations which i think should include something it, yeah. to me it's beginning to be apparent that it should include something with regard to how legislation is formed or right. proposed with regard to um, people of color and minority groups in the criminal justice system but in the interim we should have a presence if nothing else to say hey stop making up crazy bills right. that no one, you know, I mean, we appreciate the intention, I guess, but like, right. slow down. Right. Yeah. And I, I personally think, because of working around legislation for a lot of years, usually a legislator has, oh, we got this idea, they hand it off to the legislative secretary who puts it in the legal jargon that they need to, and I'm not sure if it's vetted by the lawyer at that point or, or after it's been adopted. One it's in there somewhere but i think before it gets assigned a bill or as it gets assigned a bill that process says as you create that bill and write it in the form that it needs to be like this the proper people get notified because they're, you're never going to stop people from putting in bills so no. i mean they're not going to want to because one of the problems that we have too is that not everybody in the same community agrees 100 yeah. percent okay. so so i'm just saying is they're going to as long as we get a mechanism to say here it is if you you know we might want the ability to testify and once we get it we work in our own communities to say mm -hmm. hey how do we do this how do we you know how do we come with a united front because you know the legislators if it's a, if it's controversial they'll shelve it and they'll put it right in the committee most of the time unless they're really passionate about it so i mean it's like i don't want them to say okay we're never going to deal with minority issues because such a pain because <laughs> Because they always have, everybody has to vet it, never comes out. I don't want to, I don't want to create that atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather that if we're notified, we look at it, if we have suggestions or want to testify, we deal with it. But I, I think that's reasonable for them mm -hmm. to be notified, not so much have to, we have to vet it. But I mean, at least get it, when it before it hits, when it, we know what committee it's going to be in, we have this. Mm -hmm. And then I think at that point, if we get notified, we have time to talk about it and work on it before it even comes up for discussion. I know that's kind of a pain because then you're looking at every no. I mean, in your point that why should we even be there? But I don't think we can get around that. Just because no. of, you're never going to get each community to agree on everything, so they're going to have to sort that out in testimony, right? I mean, yeah. some people will be for things. Just well, I'll use the same bill that we use for the ethnic study. Some people wanted anti-Semitism, some right. didn't. Some wanted this, some didn't want that. So that has to be sorted out by the, the legislators. But at least we're all notified, so we can at least have right. that. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm assuming there, and uh, correct me, this is sort of a question to you, Pepper. Like, how does the public become aware of a bill like this when it's at this stage? 
Yeah. Is so, it just by like looking so, at, you know, right. So the, the or this bill, you know, is it Democratic caucus, the lead sponsor stood up. This is one of four bills that she did at the exact same time. Mm -hmm. She just kind of read the intent um, and the she said I'm passing it around for sponsors. And, that, and that's just literally a spreadsheet of every uh, legislator. And you just check your name if you want to be if a sponsor. You, okay. um, you don't even have to read the bill. Um, is the very first person the person who proposes it and the rest are yes. the sponsors? Okay. And then, um, and then so that Democratic caucus or any of the caucuses are open to anyone. Then it goes on the floor and it's read for the first time on the floor. Just this bill is called um, uh, racial impact statements, mm -hmm. and then it's and then the speaker says it'll be referred to the rules on committee, which is when it was referred. And then from there, it's up to the chair to determine when and if it ever comes up. And so that is a very difficult process. Every single Monday morning, I read through all the committee agendas just to see what is coming up that week in all of the committees. And without that, I mean, there's no way to really know, you know, something could be, ha this is in the rules committee. You think this might be in the judiciary committee or might be in the government operations committee. You wouldn't know unless you just read the rules committee every single week. And um, as far as whether this, I I don't believe this is going to come off the wall, quote unquote, come off the wall mm -hmm. this, this year, but it could be taken up for testimony and then brought, you know, just because it's not being crossover doesn't mean they can't take it, take testimony on it, and then it might come up next year, and then you know it's kind of a elusive process. But the but the common I, thread though of all of this is the legal secretaries that the legislators hand this to have to create it in this format. Mm -hmm. So that is the common thread of where all bills have to pass right. through, no matter who's submitting them. So if you get that common thread of those one or two individuals that put it in this format to notify people that you won't miss anything. Because I know I have to go on the website and look at legislative bills and kind of read through. Yeah. That's a pain. But um, but I think if you can get to that common thread, it don't matter where it comes from, but it always has to pass through the guys put it in this format. Okay. Always. Um, Major, are you there? I am. She'd like to make a comment. Please. Go. I was, earlier, yeah, I was just gonna chime in with some of the um, comments along the lines of how it, it, it does sort of feel like hurting cats with some of this and then yeah. with, with DPS we have this process that, that I'm just my comment is that it takes a lot of work to try to keep track of all this stuff because these bills are fast and furious and so we have a process that where um, a person looks week and sees what is on the um, agenda for both sides of the house and bills are assigned as they come out any bill that has any impact on public safety any one of the entities under the public safety heading they get doled out to to uh, lieutenants and captains and majors to review and we have to go through this entire process of you know looking at who the external stakeholders that might support the bill. We have to comment on the external stakeholders who would be opposed to the bill. We have to talk about the programmatic impacts it could have on the department. So it's, and then, there, you know, so then there'll be like at any given moment, there's 35 members of the department who are all tracking one bill through the entire system through the session. And it's, it is just very hard to organize and keep on top of these things. And then that person will be, um, call to testify maybe or try to go and listen to what's happening over there. So my point is simply just that it does take quite a bit to keep track of all the things that are coming out of there. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. I'm, I, I'm thinking out loud. One of the things I'm thinking is a recommendation we, we may want to put forward and as I say this is half-baked. Actually less than half-baked. Um, is something like what the major was talking about that DPS does, that I don't know whether this body or the new racial equity board, but somebody ought to have that kind of clearinghouse function to get things out to stakeholders as they come up so that we actually can have the kinds of conversations that Sheila's talking about, but there's got to be some sort of method to all of this Otherwise, we're in this situation that we're in now where everybody's just sort of scratching their head. Yeah. 
I would just say that that in and of itself could be a full time job. Mm-hmm. Got it. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, Absolutely. And it sounds like the other ra- systemic racism, racial person is a paid full time position. Right. And so maybe that person should have a staff member, or I don't know what, right. what it is. That person could be doing that in, in close coordination, you know, with our council. Write that down. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, I mean, they can, just as, you know, there's things called bill reviews that, uh, mm-hmm. that um, Major Jonas was talking about, and part of that is all the impacted people that the bill might touch. And, and it seems like the racial miti- systemic racial mitigation position should be in very close coordination yes. with us. I like that. Anybody else feel? I like that. Yeah, that's part of their charge. I mean, right. it's, it's looking at policy to mm-hmm. reduce systemic racism and bias. I and mean, that would help. So this is it, this is part of that process. It's not only stuff on the books, but it's stuff coming out, I would right. think. I mean, but, you know, oops, sorry. They, I don't know, I mean, they would have to put that on. They, they have a lot of work to do, whoever this person yeah. is. I mean, so they're going to have to figure it out. But I think our only scope here is just criminal juvenile justice. But this is a bigger bigger topic right. and just all bills but uh, anyway okay I, I like the idea that that executive director should be has a minion involved, but they should identify all the players yes they have to not not they should they have to identify yeah. all the players that need to be uh, that they have to work with including our us as, yeah. and other people so okay uh, we've got, I think, is, we can put this aside for the time being and move on. Is that, they're feeling that that's all right right now? Anything else anybody wants to add? People electronically connected? <laughs> I'm, I'm good. Okay. So you have one action right. item, right? I'm here still. <laughs> I said your action item is to contact them and let them know that. Yes. Okay. Yes, I need to get on that. I need to figure out who to talk to. And I will do that. Um, the, the next item was what I thought was going to be the bigger discussion. Wow, got that wrong. Um, about the bullet points that I have sent out to you some weeks ago. Um, and we had talked at the last meeting, as you'll remember from even those of you who weren't here, I sent out the email about this meeting talking about looking at broad areas of overlap so that we can start identifying large topics, large ideas that would inform our recommendations for this final report. And I'm hoping that we can go around the room and do that and that poor Pepper will take really great minutes so that I'll have something to work off of. Um, and that was what I was hoping would be the, ma- the biggest body of this meeting. I suspect that we're going to do this now, and we're probably going to be doing this next month, too. Um, but let's get going. Uh, why don't we start? I really, I'm hoping we can go around the table. Is that? I, Am I right? Yes, no? Good, let's go around the table. Um, And everybody hold forth for a bit and talk about your bullet points, the overlaps you saw, the big issues that you saw, things that you saw lacking altogether that you feel should not be lacking. And let's start making some actual notes towards this. That would be my um, suggestion. We've had a lot of time to look over this. I don't think it's pushing it, um, but I do want to move us and give us what I would like to characterize as a gentle nudge. So, Sheila, do you want to start? Actually, can I not start? You cannot start. Major, do you want to start? I would rather not as well. <laughs> okay. Pepper, do you want to start? Um, let me pull up my bullet points. He's pulling up his bullet points. Give it a moment. Um, mine were just... Yes? 
This is Rebecca. Yes. Um, I'm happy to go second or to start quickly, and I'll try to do it quickly. Go for it, Rebecca. Okay. Pepper, do you want to go? Are you ready? No, you please go ahead. All right. I um, I have to confess that I haven't reviewed everyone's bullet points for today. I've reviewed them quickly before, but there's two themes. Um, one overall arching I saw was training. I've heard that from the public safety folks at the table. I also wanted to, um, for those who weren't here last meeting, uh, Ruben Jennings, who is a prisoner's rights office investigator, a long time uh, employee of the Office of Defender General, came and submitted a memo also related to training in terms of making his suggested recommendations based on his own professional experience, long time uh, working in the system. Um, and his point on training is similar only in the word to the public safety. The emphasis is different. Instead of spending, recommending money or more money or specific types of training for law enforcement or whoever, judges, prosecutors, etc., correctional officers, he thought, why not spend money on training to people who get exposed to these people who have implicit bias, sort of a train on Know Your Rights, right? A know Your Rights program, uh, whereas people should be informed what they have the right to do and not do in an initial encounter with the police, right? Right to an attorney, right to silence for a juvenile, right? Right to have uh, an, an independent adult who has their best interests, right? Not a principal. Signing over whatever thing so that they can call, talk to the cop, right? Um, so that was, I thought, an interesting angle. And I like hearing sort of that full picture. You don't hear that part of training. The second piece I wanted to throw out there, we've heard a lot about data collection, the limitations of data collection. Uh, we heard from DOC about how the data they're looking at is inherently flawed because of the threshold input data can't be trusted because you're not comprehensively collecting race data, one, and two, it's not standardized. And so we don't seem to even have a baseline understanding of what we're collecting, how we're collecting it, who's identifying whom, and what are the categories appropriate. The definition itself that we operate under these certain presumptions, but seems like there's no standardized sense of them. So my recommendation is start at square one. You know, can yeah. we, as a group, reach just that? and then require everyone who's a stakeholder in the system to apply a standardized sense of definitions and a standardized procedure so that when we do collect data, we can trust it, even if it will take a few years to get enough to work with it. All right, that's all I have. I like it. Thank you. Okay. Um, and you've got that? <clears throat> yes. Thank you. Because... I'm really going to be depending on you for making whatever chicken scratch I make for everyone. <laughs> um, it's hard to facilitate and remember everything at the same time for me. Uh, I don't mind going. I think quickly what, I, what I'm seeing that is the common thread, not only the training, I believe, is uh, I think minimizing continual punishment of people um, for instance, when someone is arrested, right? If they can't make bail, then they they are incarcerated. They can't. They lose their job. The family split up. I mean, you got the cost of incarcerating someone instead of maybe having them serve their time at home or what, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, because that impacts mostly minority people because yes. they can't afford bail, right? Uh, and then if they plea, they get a record, and then all of a sudden now you're a habitual offender if you get a record. So what I'm saying is look at the minimize, like does everybody need to be incarcerated? You know, what, there should be, like I put in here with bail, it should be, it's outdated. It should be the ability to pay versus flight risk. I mean, really bail was really initiated in the beginning was what's the flight risk what's or danger the to the 
the person, right? I mean, if they were in danger, they wouldn't get bail. If they're at least, if they got bail, is what's the flight risk and whether. So, I mean, I think we've lost that in our, like everybody then says get set bail and then you can, mm -hmm. you may not make it. Um, same thing with, um, you know, once you pay your debt, you continue to pay for it. Yeah. You know, I think that maybe from a criminal standpoint, it should be, uh, maybe you could view it. But I think from a background check for uh, jobs, it should you shouldn't see it unless it was a something really heinous that it might affect somebody's work. You know, like maybe you were a rapist or a murderer or something that maybe that might impact if you're going to be an LNA at a you know at a at a hospital. I think that allowing uh, it to be seen from the criminal juvenile system, but not from an employment because. You, you know as well as I do, if you see a, a, something on the record, oh, we're not hiring that person. Whether whether they could legally do it or not, they, people tend not to hire that person. Right. So they continue to pay for their crime after they've already served their time, which is not fair. If we're, if we're, mm -hmm. uh, uh, if we're in a society saying you paid your debt, you really haven't because it's on your... No. That's why I'm glad to see start seeing some of the expungements starting to happen because I think that after a certain time, I mean, if you paid your debt, you your record should be expunged at least at least from a a job. I mean, I'd like it expunged, period. But I mean, at least from employment background check, mm -hmm. um, because it, if you can never get a job, then the the, the likelihood of re reoffending is high because you're trying to make a living, you're trying to feed mm -hmm. your family. I, I I just think it just compounds. I think I think looking at risk compared to the impact on society. I think, I think, that can be done by uh, prosecutors. It can be done by judges. It can be done social by social workers, whoever. And and one of the things are one of these things. Um, also, uh, one of the things that stuck out to me is incorporating minority communities and being the solution. In other words, like how sometimes there's there's outreach places that can. Maybe be the person responsible. Not, I don't want to say be the person responsible, but you know, like you might have a parole officer. You know, he he doesn't care. He's just saying, "Are you there or not?" Or you might have somebody in the community that's that knows their situation that can actually help them, and not so much just say, "Are you here?" and not a flight risk, but actually provide services. Mm -hmm. You know, for the family, knowing that they may go into incarceration, or hey, I did this because I, I have a drug problem and I need help, or hey. You know, I need I need uh, I need some help. Parole officers or, or bail they're not doing that, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm saying get the uh, get the the community involved with these outreach uh, these these communities that might be able to help provide that family with the services they need and work closely with the parole officers or the or the bailiffs or whoever to say what is the real situation here, right? Mm -hmm. Is it is it that they're just bad dudes, or is there really a, a reason why they went down this path and maybe do more of a court diversion, because maybe they don't need prison, maybe they need rehab, maybe they need a job, maybe they need something other than prison. I, I don't know. That's I'm just saying those are my arching. I mean, I had a whole list of things by by bullet point, but I'm saying the overarching yeah thing is we've kind of lost being an advocate for the person who is actually in trouble and more towards the legal system which just wants to get them in and get them out mm -hmm. uh, when we don't really know the root cause of why they were there. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. Good sense. I don't know how we change it, but that's part of the... Well, luckily we have lots of people who write bills. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I'm saying. I think part of this recommendation is, is to, to look at stop punishing the people even right. after they've, they've paid their debt. And we don't do a good job at that, I don't think. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Are you, Pepper, do you have? Yes. Are you ready? Yeah. And I, okay. and I would like to just respond briefly that um, the, uh, the bail issue is a serious one. And I think that uh, we, you know, stakeholder group, led by the Attorney General's office, tried to tackle bail reform last year. Um, and it's a difficult issue. Um, I know that the 
um, because all misdemeanors must be bailable per the Constitution. So just thinking about uh, the danger to the public, you know, that kind of versus the flight risk, um, I think that, um, you know, if someone might have committed a minor crime but is deemed a danger to the public by a judge, um, right. that uh, he still has to impose cash bail. Sometimes it's a large amount of cash bail, which is a de facto kind of arrest. Or, yeah, he wants to keep him incarcerated. Right. Um, it's something that I think that uh, one option that has been talked about a lot uh, with respect to bail is offering some sort of risk assessment tool at arraignment. And then um, having some sort of electronic monitoring option or some sort of supervision option like a pretrial monitor which the federal right. system has um, that of course involves a decent amount of investment from the state so there's there was some reluctance to some of the just kind of flipping a switch and doing that but uh, I think that that is a topic especially I think you may have seen that um, Senator Tim Ash suggested that or, or challenged the Judiciary Committees to reduce the prison population by 250 inmates in the next four years. And a huge chunk of those people are pretrial detainees that are being held because they either can't pay bail or, bail, um, or they're deemed or they're held without bail. Um, and so Senator Sears just today was talking about, well, we need to find a way. I think judges would be more willing to release more of that 400 detainee population if there's some more monitoring um, during that kind of pretrial period. Um, with respect to expungement, um, I was working on a study committee, and actually a bill passed out of the House Judiciary Committee today, 10 to nothing, um, that expands expungement to, I think, uh, probably about 15 new felony crimes, uh, which is a big deal. Um, it doesn't go far enough, and in fact, we propose uh, having just a standard ceiling, which is kind of what you're talking about, where it's not accessible to the general public, but it could be um, accessed by um, a law enforcement officer if they're seeking a warrant or something like that, or a, a judge if you know he's sentencing someone um, for a subsequent crime. Um, we had a proposal, and we're going to continue to work on it, that would apply a standard timeline to all crimes for sealing and expungement. So seal first and then expunge second. And that would be all, all kind of non-serious violent crimes, I, I, I should say. Um, and that's something that we're going to continue to work at because it's kind of piecemeal, add a few crimes here, add a few crimes the next year, you know. Um, I think just a more universal, holistic approach to sealing and expungement makes a lot more sense than that. Um, with respect to my bullet points, um, I think that my bullet points really, I think, focused on the high impact, high discretionary decision points um, in the criminal justice system from the prosecutor side. And I took them largely from the article that you sent around. And um, I just, I'll summarize them quickly here. Just the initial charging decision, the utilization of criminal justice alternatives, including pre-charge programs, diversion, Tamarack, youthful offender, and drug treatment court. Um, making plea deals, um, and then uh, state attorneys, are, um, we don't actually sentence people, but we do make recommendations, and those um, should be tracked. Um, and then uh, the expungement decision, because we are involved in that as well. Um, I would say that uh, there's a great number of counties um, that have had people, outside groups, come in and look at those data points. And if you look in the article that you sent around, they referenced this VARE Institute kind of public awareness project um, mm. that did this in five or six counties. And, um, you know, it, it was very informative, um, the kind of results. And there were racial disparities. I, I don't think there's a big surprise there. Um, and. The one thing that I would recommend, though, if we do go down the kind of data collection, is that if, if there is a mandate to do this, it's going to fall to me. And I, I'm not going to get paid anything extra. It's a huge project. You know, we're talking about 14 states attorneys, 22,000 cases a year. Um, and uh, I would just say that if we do make a recommendation about data collection, people. That, that it involve some people to actually do the work. And they should be independent from the states attorneys. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be. It wouldn't look good. Right. <laughs> um, so that would be my, uh, I mean, another thing that I got to say is that part of the contribution to this kind of churn in the 
criminal justice system, just get people in, get people out, is that there are a huge number of cases. People don't get to spend enough time on the individual. They don't get to know the individual. Um, that's true of the public defender's office and the state's attorney's office. Um, I think that there is a lot of pressure to uh, accept plea deals, make plea deals, um, just because of the caseloads. And so, I mean, I know it's self-serving, but paying public defenders more, paying uh, state's attorneys more, might actually have a better impact than creating more churn. Having more people involved might actually reduce the um, uh, disparities, not increase them. Hmm. But, well, I guess that's, that's why my question is, is that if the defense attorneys are overwhelmed because of the caseload, then by by putting monitoring devices, if you need to, to allow the individual to continue to work, yeah. be with the family, and until their case comes due, right. that would remove the pressure that we have to do something. It also then would allow uh, defendants like the people who have minor offenses in prison to be able to then go out on the street, sure. and then you could pull back the people from out of state. But I'm saying is that would be the money justification of saving money not only to the system of incarceration, because what is it, like eighty or $100,000 per... 60, what, 80, some, yeah. I'm saying is, so So if you look at it, everyone they incarcerate, it's going to cost 80000 I doubt an ankle bracelet's going to cost eighty grand, right? If, if that's what somebody wants to do, right? Uh, or, you know, bringing that prison population back, which is then going to save, but also the defense attorneys and because if they're overwhelmed and they can't do a good job for the person that they're defending, then that's a disservice to the person because like I said, if they're gonna take a plea deal just to get out, then now they become a habitual offender the next time because they've already got a record. That compounds the racial disparity issue. So mm -hmm. I'm saying is, I, I just think that's a, a huge, and, and how can we support you on that, those other efforts that you're talking about because I think they're all important. I mean, that's just my, I don't want to take up because there's other people wanting, but I, I'm just saying is, I think we've hit onto something yeah. mm -hmm. that we could really make an impact yeah. on, but that's just my opinion. I keep okay. saying, let's take great notes because yeah, I'm no, going to write yeah, this yeah, up. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to chime in, this is Ingrid, I, I'm capturing most of what people are saying and I'm just feeling like I need to name the fact that... Um, community-based advocates for survivors of domestic and sexual violence are probably not in support of some of the same bail kind of conversations that I've heard this evening, and I just want to name that because I think we mm -hmm. can't forget that. Um, I don't know where that brings us, but I just respect their opinion and their insight on, on that in terms of what it means for safety, given that domestic homicide is such a real issue and is that oftentimes the ha half the homicides in Vermont every year come, at, come out as being as a result of um, domestic up. violence. So I just want to put that out there. And also in terms of habitual offender, that status, and there are people in the room who obviously know a lot more than I do, but that is not an easy status to attain as far as I know. Um, I can think of very few cases over a long period of time where that was ever the case and this is repeat sex offenders and so I don't I don't know how how easy that really is to to attain as a status um, given some of the scenarios that we talked about today but I'm totally open to hearing other points on, on that I just don't want us to get too far ahead thinking that there's rampant habitual offender status being handed out in Vermont. Uh, so, my two cents right now, but... Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I could echo some of the things that were said there. Um, uh, one of the reluctance to putting, we have a home detention program for people that are on pre-trial detainees, um, and one of the reluctance to putting uh, violent folks on that um, is the fact that it takes at a minimum um, two hours to respond and that's under the best case scenario um, and so that for uh, people that are committing domestic violence it's just sometimes an unacceptable risk um, 
and uh, and with respect to the habitual offender, uh, there, in order to be charged as a habitual offender, you have to have three felonies and then commit a fourth felony. Yeah, I'm not talking, when I'm saying habitual, it might be the wrong term, but okay. I'm saying is you're going to show up on the radar as having a record. And, and, and I think to your point, Major, is that um, we're not talking about letting maybe this process be for violent criminals or in domestic abuse situations that that might, I'm talking about maybe a drug bust or some petty theft or, or something that's non-violent that wouldn't be so much a victim uh, threat. I, I'm talking about those kind of things that wouldn't be a threat to a person or to the public, right? That's, that's more what I'm talking about. Yes, um, okay. I think it's also just important to keep in mind that our charge is, for example, just using bail laws as an example, our charge is to make sure, to, to make recommendations to the legislature to make sure that whatever bail statutes are in effect are not being applied disproportionately right. to people of color and minorities. So it, I, I don't see us necessarily, and, and some of the ideas that may come out are about you know, ways that some statutes do need to be changed because they can't, you know, in the way that they are presently, um, you know, enshrined in statute, they just can't be applied um, fairly to everyone or they or they too easily can be applied disproportionately to um, communities of color but um, so I guess I just want to make that point to sometimes it's easy because we're talking about the criminal justice system I think sometimes it's easy to <coughs> sort of forget the focus on you know we're not I mean, I absolutely hear you, Ingrid, and I know that there are advocacy groups that are always going to be, want to be heard on on any issues around amending statutes that have you know have a potential impact on victims. Um, but I think it's important to keep in mind that we are talking about um, just making sure that whatever laws we do have an effect, or you know, however our yes. system is working, yes. is not being applied disproportionately. Yes. Um, I don't have a lot more to add because I never did bullet points, and maybe by next month I will. But um, <laughs> don't write that, Pepper. <laughs> <laughs> That's the last time. It's on film, no. But I do, well, a couple of things. Um, Aton, I actually found a note from last month that goes to what you were talking about earlier about oh, good. the discussion. I wrote Aton, and then I wrote. <laughs> Is there a way to document the racial impact of certain decisions? Because we talk a lot about training and stuff. And so, for example, um, you know, when we were talking earlier, it was in the context of this proposed bill right. and like um, sort of uh, putting into law a requirement that you uh, discuss the racial impact of a potential law somehow and right. to, you know the chief's point it's like if we knew what the racial impact was going to be then we'd make the perfect laws, then we would, right? right um but the example that we used when we were talking about it last well, two weeks ago was um for example we talked so much about trainings and i am fully on board that a lot of people need to be trained about a lot of stuff mm -hmm. but like how do we then um to determine if that training actually had any effect, like if that training actually right. has the outcomes that we are hoping it will have. And so I don't know how we do that, but it's something to either. keep in mind, I guess, yeah. when we continue to talk about trainings. And I also just speaking of trainings, I did want to follow up on um, Rebecca's, uh, what Rebecca shared from the memo that Ruben wrote. Right. Um, Rebecca and I last October went to Baltimore for a conference that was put on by the national, one of the national criminal defense organizations. Um, and it was talking about these very issues. Mm -hmm. Like, and um, there was a woman from Philadelphia, like the public defender of Philadelphia, who talked about this program with this guy from California, I think came to Philly and helped develop these. They're sort of know your rights programs but they're ongoing they're like you develop it he helps you start it in your community and it's a regular event where people in the community can come and 
like either they're involved possibly or they have family members who are involved in the system and they can get their questions answered essentially. And I, I feel like, to, um, I'm not gonna remember the name of it and I've made a, myself a note to try to find the information that I got at that conference last fall so I can talk about it in more detail um, to this group. But I do think it is, um, one of the goals of it is to have it be uh, community-based and community-run, sort of like this issue that we've been talking about, about the failure to include the people who are the stakeholders right. who are directly impacted. So I do think there's an aspect and an element of that. And so I just, I think it kind of um, dovetails with, you know, what Rebecca was right. talking about. And I would love to see as part of our recommendations, some talking about some way to get the community more involved in Knowing their, you know, in knowing their rights, but also sort of when they're involved in the criminal justice system, having a sort of monthly meeting that they like that gets publicized in their community that they know that they can go to to get information about what's going, not mm -hmm. specifically what's going on with their case or their son's case or whatever, but just in general right. about the process. Um, and I think that that will inevitably. Um, something like that would inevitably reach a lot of communities, color, immigrant communities, mm -hmm. minority communities, um, if we, if it was done in such a way that it was accessible to all of right. those people. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to mention a point um, brought up is like, yes, our charge is to say, is this law applied equally? But I think we, we can give a little more richness because in other words, if you say minimum bail is set at $1,000, yes, that is charged to white, black, Asian, doesn't matter. It's equal across the board. The problem is, is statistically, right. people of color are poor and they can't afford it. So then, yeah, even though the law is applied equally right. and they're all charged the same amount, it impacts people of color more because they can't afford it. That's, so I think we do have some sort of obligation to say even if the law is applied equally, it's implicitly mm -hmm. hurting right. people who can't afford bail. Because and, the playing field is right. So I think level. we, yeah. the, exactly. since we have this diverse diversity on this committee, mm -hmm. I think part of that charge is also saying that this is the this is why it impacts that those people so much, and that's why we're recommending this change, even if the mm -hmm. law is. Okay, everything's set to a hundred bucks or a thousand. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it does. I mean, if you're if you're a person of privilege and you can just throw out a thousand bucks without blinking an eye and you're on bail, well, some people can't do that. Right. Um, and that's why I'm saying is that's where how we're going to make change. Because mm -hmm. if we just go in and say this is applied equally and yes, it's a thousand bucks for everybody, they're going to say okay, that's equal, move on to the next thing, and it, we, and you know what I mean. I don't um, know if we have an obligation to bring that to light. I, I oh, think. I think we do. I mean, I, like um, that. You just made me think of one other thing that I wanted to talk about, which is I see um, a little bit of a thread in some of the different bullet points about can like about consistency isn't exactly the right word, but like the results of the same type of criminal case in different counties in this state can be wildly different. And that's because, you know, uh, state's attorneys are elected and take wildly different approaches to criminal justice in their counties. Um, different judges take different approaches and impose different sentences, you know, wildly different sentences for the same thing. And so on the one hand, that's a problem. But on the other hand, people like the other end of the spectrum is sentencing guidelines, right? And we know, to your point, like, sentencing guidelines also are a problem because, for example, in the federal system, the guidelines for crack cocaine were much, much higher than for powder cocaine, right. and um, that disproportionately impacted communities of color as opposed to white people. So um, I do think it's important... I, I, I don't know the answer, and I, but I do think it's important to point out and to, uh, that there are layers to this and, um, and what we, it becomes overwhelming, I feel like, when we talk about it because really we're trying to um, come up with ways to 
achieve equality in the criminal justice system when the criminal justice system is actually the end right. of the problem. It's not the beginning. Um, and so, yes. right. like, someday, sometimes, like right now, I feel like this whole discussion is somewhat futile because no matter what we do, I mean, it's not futile. We can, we can do what we can try to do to improve the system that we're talking about, but it is kind of the end. It's not the beginning where the problems are really starting. So that sure. that's a great thank you. Um, yeah. Um, so the way I looked at all this stuff is like I just have. Whew, I was just I was overwhelmed by the document, by the bullet points, by the cross going back and forth, and ultimately at the end of the day. It equaled for me where we have to understand the proper diagnosis of the problem to understand the cure, right? I think we can agree with that. And for me, the problem that I see is white supremacy. And that's what you're really talking about. I'm just going to put words to it because sure. I'm brave enough to do that. And, and if we're not here or here or here going to address the bigger system that's at play, which is white supremacy, that goes into the things you talked about, about the disproportionate... Um, crack cocaine that goes into everything we know to exist, if we're not willing to do that and be on the same page that that's what's actually really going on, then we're not going to get to the cure of what we need to do. So even in this room, we haven't, some of us are offended by the way we use race or racism or even white supremacy or implicit or explicit. If we are uncomfortable, we should be uncomfortable because it's a serious issue, but we can't all get on the same page that the diagnosis is actually white supremacy and what that means and how each of us pl play into that. Because white supremacy affects us all, it just affects us each differently depending on how we navigate through the world. So when you're talking about that, that brings up a lot of points that I had. I think the organization you might be talking about is LEAP, which was Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. They would travel around and give flex your rights um, trainings. And though I think that that is great. Um, I've been a part of those. I've helped host those, and I think they're a great uh, initiative. It's not the solution to the problem, because I know my rights, mm -hmm. and they haven't helped me yet. Mm -hmm. So people can have know their rights and be fueled with that information, but that's not what the problem is. And then again, that's putting it back on the people who are the ones who are most disproportionately impacted. So it's for me. I didn't know my rights. That's why I got jacked up today. I didn't know my rights. That's not why I got jacked up today, you know? And so I just, I want us to be careful that, I think there's a yes and, I'm not saying that those trainings are good, I think that they need to be complemented with actual training within, across the fear of all these departments. Mm -hmm. And that training includes anti-racist training, all the different, whatever language you want to use for equity, racism, cultural competency, and those words do matter. But something that actually gets at the root of white supremacy and what's playing out, because white supremacy is playing out in our policies, it's playing out in our laws, it's playing out in our language, it's playing out in our behaviors, it's playing out in our roles, period. And we keep on talking about data. I'm done with the data conversation because we keep on talking about how to collect data. We, every single piece of data that's come forth to this group, we've all been like, are you serious? It hasn't been anything we haven't known for, again, 10, 20 years. We keep on acknowledging, we've written reports, we have bills being created. We understand that there's disproportionate treatment, outcomes, effects, behaviors, everything with regards to race. I think we're in agreement of that. So I'm trying to figure out what collecting, so I'm not going to personally send you to collect more data because I'm trying to understand that, yes, the data that we've collected is not a good collection matter, manner. And... Um, we know that racism exists, and we know that brown and black people are disproportionately being affected, and we know that this is going on. So I don't understand the whole data collection when we talk about that. It really confuses me of why we keep going around and around to collect something we already know that exists, and now we need to actually do something about it. Um, the other concerns I have is I agree with a, basically most of everything that you said, um, Chief Stevens. And some of the issues you brought up when looking at this other bill that we were looking at of H381. And 
certain language that's used. I mean, even in the languages that we create and in the laws and the systems and the bills, it has a lot of racist language in it. And so as that gets funneled out from bill to bill or committee to mi committee, we are inherently putting that back out and putting that on ourselves and we're perpetuating that cycle even amongst ourselves in this group. So even in some of the um, documents we read and some of the bullet points, there was a question about what does minority areas mean? That's an example. So what does that mean? What do, and we could all have a different example of what that means. But when we start putting language to things and we don't have the same understanding of what that language means and then we don't understand how that language oppresses people or how it hurts people, that's a real problem. So I'm concerned about how we use the language, how we explain the language, and what we mean by the language when we're using these things. I'm concerned about, um, I try to like do the whole comparison thing and that is like, yeah, we're all like trainings and this and that, but some of the things that came up for me is disc discretion. The huge amount of discretion that the department has across the board in so many different ways, from being elected to the officer gets to decide, you get a ticket today or a warning, to the judges make, I mean, the discretion is unbelievable. And that goes across all of, all of the different categories that we're mentioning. And how do we create systems and checkpoints to not have that discretion? To, or if there is that discretion to, um, to be documenting that or to be doing something with that discretion? Because I found that to be a very serious issue. And so thinking about discretion, I think about oversight. And again, it's internally investigated, usually, right? So people are investigating themselves when, when all this happens and we still haven't figured out an external accountability system. And so going to the community, I agree that there should be community oversight. I agree with some of the um, solutions. There have been different oversight committees that have been created in different communities, such as my community where I come from. There was a police uh, community police committee that was created and I actually sat on that oversight committee. But it had no teeth. It had no power. It had no, it had nothing. It had nothing. It was just a body of people that, that they decided to place there to have a placeholder. And if we're not going to actually um, listen to the people or engage the people or give the people power, then I'm, I'm a little bit confused of how we're doing that. Um, I'm concerned that we brought this up numerous times. Um, again, I'm going to say it again, not about us without us and that we have to be at the table. We have to be notified. We have to be there. We have to be part of talking about these solutions within our communities and what is going on. And that has to be across the board with everything. Um, some laws that I personally think that need to be changed is um, the actual laws of immunity or sovereignty that, that officers hold. That feeling as though, though they are in a bubble and there is nothing you can do to flex your rights. Because it, 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 from what I've learned and discovered from the legal stuff that I've read is that officers are not even considered people, which I found to be very interesting, at least by the language that's being used that I read, is that they're so protected that whenever anything happens, that how are you supposed to um, find justice or how are you supposed to go through that complaint process when at the end it's full-blown immunity? in these situations. So I have some concerns around the laws and why um, they're at such a higher level and why, um, what happens in those disciplinary realms. Like what is going on to where we can't hold our law enforcement accountable for their behaviors. And all of this really equals, and I really, um, I take point to what you said, is um, paying our, our attorneys better wages. Um, yeah and um, putting money where our mouths are. Mm. Like, none of this can happen. I read through this report and I don't have maybe the succinct things that people want me to say because we can say whatever we want to say, but if we're not willing to, one, understand the diagnosis, and two, put money to it, we're just going to be sitting here for another year mm. doing absolutely nothing. And that's the bottom line. We have to understand what we're really up against, what we're really in, and we have to be willing to morally commit our finances to this. And that means, because everything everybody suggested in their bullet points basically takes money. Yep. Basically. 
So at the end of the day, we're just going to sit here. Oh, how do we get that money? Oh, we can't get that here. Oh, this. Well, we do have suggestions. Stop locking so many people up, and then you got 80000 a pop. <laughs> we do have real suggestions, but nobody's hearing those real suggestions, or it's not moving quick enough. And so, again, we have to be able to diagnose the problem. And for me, sitting at this table, the problem is white supremacy and how it plays out across all these systems, and that might be a hard word for some people to digest, and that's okay. We can unpack that later. And money, if, we, if this is our moral commitment as the state of Vermont to do this work, then we need to commit our finances to it, and we need to stop passing the buck around to somebody else, because every time there's something going on, we pass it on to somebody else. It's somebody else's problem within the system, rather than us knowing that it's ours. So I think... Those were the main things that I had to address. That was great. And yeah, I just want more accountability mechanisms and I want people to recognize racism as a public health issue and it's up to our society to make that better. Thank you. Um, this is such a tiny portion of what Sheila just talked about, but it just made me think of a question. Pepper, you talked earlier about Tim Ash, I think, proposing um, challenging, challenging Senate Judiciary and House Judiciary Committees. Okay. To, I know you said something about 250 fewer like 2022. people. 2022. Okay. Um, is the, would the sa are the savings from that the the theoretical savings from that earmarked for anything specific? No, they're not. I think that number the 250 people was chosen because that's roughly the number of people that are out of state. So it would be pretty much bring everyone back home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, can you say that out loud and look at the camera again? <laughs> I don't have to say it. He said he's the one that uh, did the challenge. I mean, that's his, that's his talking point. Okay. I'm sorry if that question just no? came to mind and so I wanted to ask it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really good question because we, exactly, we can be That'd doing be all that and then it not actually benefit us in moving forward in the direction that we need to be used for something else. Well, I mean, that, so it is something to keep in mind that mm -hmm. if, if we're talking about trying to reduce the number of people incarcerated, we can certainly make recommendations about what those savings should, right. how those savings should be funneled right. back to addressing what we're yep. charged with trying to address. Absolutely. Write that down. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, and I also, I mean, just to think, you know, not to disagree with Sheila because she has a great, lot of great points, but I know I took law enforcement in college and I wouldn't want to be a police officer right now because they're always being quarterback. You're making split decisions. And in big cities, say not, maybe not as much as Vermont, but like Chicago or something. I mean, you walk out that door every day that you're just going to be killed just as well as people on the street. And and I can tell you, being in the service and being trained to be under fire, you react and sometimes you, you have a lot of trauma yourself. That's why police officers have one of the highest rate of suicide. Mm -hmm. right? I'm just saying is I, I don't want to pin it. Yes, there's bad apples sometimes. And yes, I think recruiting more officers of color as well, putting the money into... Uh, reaching out to the inner cities or these places that really have a lot of population of people of color to bring people in, I think, to be part of that conversation. Uh, I don't know how much, I know you guys recruit uh, for people uh, to bring people of color to be diverse. Uh, I don't know of any Abenaki police officers yet, but, um, but I'm just saying is I think that putting those dollars into recruiting in areas where people of color live or having some kind of uh, intern on the job, try to pull people into that into that realm will will be tremendous. I mean, I, I agree. There's some bad bad uh, immunity where sometimes they say I felt threatened and now I'm off the hook. But uh, I just you know, mean any accountability. But I, but I also think I want to be also fair on the flip side that I know uh, I don't know about Vermont because I'm not in the police force, but I know out in in other areas. They're under tremendous pressure, and 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 suicide rates and secondary uh, quarterbacking. Right. I mean, um, I, I I'm not defending either way. I'm just saying is I, I don't want to put it all thinking that well cops just do whatever they want because there has been some that are prosecuted for different things. But and I hope I didn't give that impression. No, no, I just want to clarify that because no, no, I said, but I just want to. And I will say that. Um, 
I will say that's it. Yes, and every day I walk out of my door as a brown person, I'm under attack. And so, and I don't get paid for it. So, mm -hmm. valid, and it's, it's valid on the other side, too. You know, I see, I see, we see those banners that say, we were conquered, not, uh, you, you know what I'm talking about. I do. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, you know where they're pointing that at, right? Because mm -hmm. we were here first. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, we won't go down that road, because I don't want to give them any press. But, mm. we understand, uh, I, I, know what I know what you're talking about. But not quite as bad, because of... Oh, in a different way. In a different way. No, but you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. We walk that walk, but we all walk it in a different way. Yep. Major. Major? Yes, I'm here. Do you, do you, I think you're the, you're, you, we were w wait, hoping for your bullet points. I think we're at a quarter of eight, and we were hoping to hear from you, too. Yeah, you, too. <laughs> all right, well, I will admit my bullet points are sort of, I haven't, it's been a while since I've read all of the other comments, so I'm not sure that they are very well uh, selected in terms of commonalities. I think, you know, I know that data is a difficult thing to, uh, we've learned a lot about data in our own process over the years, but I do think that standardization of data collection, if that is a road that we're going to recommend, I think the standardization of it has to occur because otherwise we're we're really making things very difficult. It's very hard to measure. And I and I did hear Sheila earlier say that data doesn't really matter. It's like why do we need to have data to show us what we already know? And I hear that. Um, but there certainly has been a lot of talk about data, and I think it's you know it's certainly something that can inform us around improper practices and or can give us a starting point to dig deeper. So if we are to make data recommendations, I do agree with all the bullet points or comments that have to do with some way to standardize um, and some way to start at the beginning and follow people through to the end and see where they end up. I think David Chair had some bullet points um, that resonated. I'll have to find them again, but um, David, are you still there? He's not here at the moment. He had he um, was called away. Okay, all right. Well, he has some points that I have to find again. Um, I do, and then I think it was was it Jessica that was saying that really by the point that a person enters the criminal justice system, it's like. It's so late in the stage of things. I think that was really profound. And um, but having said that, I think that there has to be some sort of meaningful awareness raising and training around um, recognizing, um, you know, whether it, whether we call it unconscious or conscious bias. It doesn't. I think we have to talk about the human condition of, of um, how we categorize people in these unhealthy, un unethical, unfair ways. So I do think that, you know, police have made some big steps in terms of um, awareness raising, and I think that I don't, I'm not aware of where that's at with other steps or points in the criminal justice and juvenile justice system, but I think there has to be a lot more, like, taking off, like waking up to the fact that, holy crap, we're all in this together and we have to, we have to start talking about this more, um, meaning how we, how bias can impact our decisions um, when we have discretion. Um, and let's see, I think more accountability mechanisms, I, you know, that's clear that, um, just for the, for the very fact that we lose that we lose trust and legitimacy as a system or as players in the system if we don't have more accountability mechanisms. I don't know what those all look like, and I think and I get I try to hold my tongue when we talk about you know police accountability, police accountability because I feel I have my own views on you know having worked in the internal affairs division for quite some time and. 
feeling like we do, like state police has an accountable system and other people would argue that it isn't. And so I don't want to have any type of argument with that, but I do think the overarching point is mechanisms that people can believe in, um, one of which is, you know, the, the complaint mechanism that I think is we're cast with as a, as a um, panel. So those are kind of my main, those are sort of the main overarching themes, but um, I will admit I haven't read every single bullet in everybody's points, so. I think it's okay, because we're just, we're trying to get some place to start. Yeah. We'll be doing, I mean, we're gonna, whatever I come up with, obviously everyone's gonna edit and rip apart and we'll add and subtract and do that calculus. Yeah. And then I don't, I feel like there has to be, um, I mean, this is really high level work that needs to have dedicated personnel um, to sort of, you know, try to find a way to, to articulate the impact of decisions across every single point in a criminal and juvenile justice system. I don't think it's giving it the right, and I know that the original report that went in made comments to this effect, and I agree with that, that this is not something that we can just task with people who have, you know, lots of other responsibilities and full-time jobs, and then just leave it to a panel on its own to try to come up with I mean, I think we can do a darn good job, but this is stuff that has to be recognized and valued as, you know, on its own merit. Like people who are, whose job it is to work and to run these committees and be paid a good wage to work with all the stakeholders. And, you know, I guess my point is just that this isn't something we can just quickly come up with. This is a problem that came over time and we're not going to unscrew it in a couple months through one report and I think we have to have more dedicated personnel who really um, care and who are really um, care about fairness and care about the future of, of Vermont so those are a couple comments great thank you mm -hmm. Jeff uh, couple things. Uh, <clears throat> first off, I, I have to agree entirely with Sheila, but I completely linearly connect money with people, as the major was just saying. We just, I think we need people to do the work that we desire to be done here. Mm -hmm. and I don't think any of us really have the time, money, or the time. Sorry really. to interrupt, but could you just put the phone a little bit closer over there? Sure, it's going. Okay. Sorry about that, Major. I said, right. I said right. evil things about you. They can do that. <laughs> 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 okay. uh, I don't know if that's what, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know if you, that's what you meant, Sheila, but I, that's what I feel the money would be most useful for, okay? Um, on the other hand, data, if you look at Burlington and the UVM study, just one disparity, people of color tickets versus warnings spoke very, very clearly and loudly to me. The disparity was enormous mm -hmm. in Burlington for that. So I'm not willing to cast all data aside. Um, I think that one actually hit the chief pretty hard in Burlington, and he made much better collection. Yeah, mm -hmm. the next time around. So it was it was a, it was a good piece. Um, I've got some questions. Um, maybe um, <clears throat> the lieutenant can help me out with this. Is lodging still directly connected to quote ties to the community as it was when I was on the road? It's it's gotten a little bit more. Now you're going directly to judges. And okay. the judges, so right. that, that's because that, that take more things into consideration. Seems to me that's a direct linear line again to to um, to getting in, you know, stepping in the system. When I look at all of this, I can't look at any of it because it's so huge. It's 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 all encompassing. So what I try to look at is how do we make entry into that 
pipeline, which is the criminal justice system, less disparate. That's all I'm trying to think of because I can't look on the, the broad, broad issue. So, and in pipeline entry, in terms of limiting people's the rest of their lives is perhaps a look at the definition of, of felony, which closes almost all the major dogs in your life forever, okay? And certainly addresses the, the major's issue of, of, of crimes against women, threats against women, but misdemeanor to felony can also be how much you steal when you shoplift, right? right? Mm -hmm. And that to me, so I say crimes against people, crimes against property is always the way I would rather see it. If, if I mean, you could, what is it, $1,000? No, I don't even know what it is. It used to be 500 It used to be 500 I think it's, it's 900 but these, but those types of laws like don't <laughs> yeah. get reviewed for decades and decades. Yeah, exactly. And okay. the so, you know, values yeah. change so dramatically in that time. For the new Nikes, right? right? right. So, you yeah. know, that's, that's a felony. It's, I don't know if it is here. You'd have to educate me, but but the, <laughs> they're ugly too. But that's another thing. Uh, so that's that's one area that I see. Again, I'm thinking avoiding the pipeline. Um, and in terms of accountability to police, I, I prefer, and I, I I went pretty long on this with the ACLU last board meeting. I'd rather talk about transparency about what's going on. Mm -hmm. If I get picked up for anything, I'm on page three of the paper or on channel three news. When the police shoot someone, you don't even get their names. Gene Duplis was the first one I ever saw, which was this morning, which... Ours is released in 24 hours usually. Yeah, yeah, okay, but there's a lot of cases where there's no transparency in what really happened, okay? And yeah. um, I think accountability, I think transparency is a better way to go in it and then to discuss accountability when we have better transparency. Hmm. You can't even get half of the um, body cams, but if they get you on the car camera, that's in the news the next morning, okay? That's not transparent. Um, I'll, I'll be quiet here in a second. Um, basically, when I see bail, I, I see it biased, but it's not just that people of color, it's biased against the poor. And I yes. think we're much better off addressing it in that fashion. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it's biased against people of color because the entire movie the entire apparatus affects people of color or Native Americans who may not be of color or more. We're know, color, we're red. We, we are, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. But you know what I'm saying, right, <laughs> Chief? It's like, but it affects your yeah. poor people, right? Right, And the Native Americans who suffer the same poverty, right. you know, that people of color do. And so I see it as would be more effectively addressed by us as poverty, poverty, bias against poverty, which certainly covers all the people of color, all the single women who can't make it work, whatever color they are. Um, and again, it's, it's, to me, I look at the thing and the problem is so big and it's so ingrained, you know, and we've got people in this country making deals and parachutes for, you know, a hundred million dollars. They've got a lot of power. Let's just, if we can affect entry, then we can affect something. And that's really, I know that's a, perhaps a foolish dream, mm -hmm. but once you're in that pipeline, you're screwed, right? Once you get in that pipeline, you can never maybe climb out again. And so, and you and I both know that I can, I, I could, if I was on the road and I was being a jerk and I didn't like someone for whatever reason, and sometimes it was a woodchuck who had an attitude, attitude all you got to do is with no warning, snatch at their hand, they whip their hand back, 
resisting arrest, right? That's the charge. It's that easy to make. I'm not saying I ever made it, but I was. it's been made on me when I was a kid, right? I just sat you. You're going to pull back. Resisting arrest. That's a charge. And it's an easy one to create after you step inside their space, right in their face, and crank them up. So what I'm saying is it's entry. And I'll be quiet now. It's entry against the poor, which covers everybody, okay? And I think that may be a battle. I don't know if people disagree with me, but that may be where we need to fight the battle, okay? You know, there's one thing I want to mention, too, is that, and, and this may be, I don't think it's out of line, but uh, I'm glad you're here. Because yeah, I know you missed, I admit you missed some. We're talking about the overwhelming work this is, and that one panel can't change it and overnight. And to the major's point is, you really need people to work on this. So since this is the AG panel, why couldn't the AG create a position or have a position that they haven't filled, and and task people with this? Same thing maybe with the state's attorney. Maybe the law enforcement community uh, has a person dedicated to work on this kind of issue. Same thing with the Department of Corrections, who obviously Lisa's not here anymore. But maybe there are people already designated. But, I mean, why why couldn't this panel, without having to go to the legislature saying, oh, we got to create a new position with more money, why, is there a way to convince the departments who have charge over this now to create those or fill a open position with that and just change what the dis what their responsibility might be. I don't know the answer to that, but I mean if you have a hundred people now, what's one on one? Or if somebody leaves, oh okay, maybe my budget can't handle, but okay, somebody leaves, you still have a hundred, but ninety nine are working on this and now that hundredth person is focusing on this, just like in Maybe your area. Why? Why couldn't this panel t ask the departments to do that? I mean, if we really want meaningful change, I mean, we have corrections, we have the state police, we have the attorney general, we have the state's attorney. That you know how many five people could, if, if just right. say every one of those departments or even DCF too. Imagine if all those people created one position to handle all of this stuff that we're talking about today. What a difference that would make outside of meeting once a month. I, I'm just throwing that out there. It's not only could we recommend to the broader community, but why can't we do something about it here within our own committee? Maybe I'm out of line, but... I think it's a decent idea, I mean, it's, and I think that we've got sixty to 80000 a pop from the people that are not going to yeah, be in jail yeah. to be able to pay them, so... I mean, it... No, but I was just... Yeah, I mean... It's a good question. I think we have... To, you know, there's a lot of assumptions. Well, I know. To, but, yeah. What do I you mean, mean by that? Who... who that there are going to be open places in the departments that, that exist at the moment. Uh, well, we have to make that our value, that. right? We have to decide it because positions are money and money is value. Right. And so we have to understand that we value this work and we value our commitment to doing this work. So we have to create those positions because they're part of our value. So if it's 101, just like Chief Stevens saying, it's, it's a 99 who are working on something else and two who are on this, right. you know? So it's 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 how we do i mean we do that in our personal lives right we all have our own mm -hmm. personal budgets we value certain things over others that might be cable <laughs> that might be our nike shoes that might be our car that might be good organic food at the co-op whatever it is but we all shift our our budgets based on our values of what we have for things and we have to as a society and as a state, we have to start committing um, our values to the money that we need to do things. Well, and I, as an example, too, I hear law enforcement, I don't know about major, I don't want to speak for you, but a lot of times I hear in these meetings, we have a hard time recruiting people, that we have a lot of opening, we have open positions, but we can't fill them for whatever reason. So, okay, if you have an open position, even though they may or may not be an officer, maybe that... <laughs> that one of those open positions could be 
reshifted and 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 maybe created to tackle some. I don't know. Maybe I'm not lying. Yeah. We did it. Well, that's what I'm saying. But, but I'm saying there may be other. There may be other. There may be other departments. I'm not saying, I know you do it. I know. Yeah. But I'm, I agree with you 100. Yeah. You know. That, it's putting, I think Sheila hit yeah. the. Sheila said it. You guys are laughing because that's what we did with with the FIT position that Gary is in. And, right. Um, and but you, yes, good point. Usually, that's a good example. Yeah. I agree with what okay, Sheila is saying. I guess step it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you don't need to go <laughs> You'll be ahead of the curve. No. <laughs> it's okay. putting value where yeah, we, yeah, yeah. other agencies need to, and I think that's something we've mentioned before. Mm -hmm. Is where you know where yeah. are these other agencies doing it? Yeah. Who's doing it well and mimic that behavior? Yeah, don't so. make an additional. Well, how would we encourage that, that though? Because that's that's. I do like um, that idea, Chief? You know, the only thing. You know, I mean, you can't just okay, go ahead, folks. We're going to start winding up though, because nah. it's after eight. I think you can spread it like very well. Like 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 right, money is your value. Money is your value. It is a reflection of values. I also just want to say, as a sort of basic point, something you said earlier. When this panel speaks, it will have a really impactful voice. So if you want to make that one of the recommendations, that may right. go, really go somewhere. So I just think. Um, Can you like bold that one? Yeah. <laughs> I'm being serious. And I think what David, David said. What, when this panel speaks, it will have a powerful voice. And uh, so let's not sort of lose sight of the fact that we ourselves sitting in this room are going to be able to have an impact. Okay. Rebecca, are you still there? Did you have a final last words? You're quick. It's really staticky. Any last words? Quick last words. I, I have no quick last words. Okay. I think she said I, she makes a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, I will do that really briefly, but can I make the the there are no public there's no public commentary. I'm gonna start when I get the minutes scribbling stuff down. I will get that out to people to attack, change, add, and so on and so forth. Um, I don't think we need any new business. <laughs> I think we have plenty of new business. Um, the next meeting will be on the 9th of April. Place to be announced. I will send out an email as always. Re uh, Rebecca's already made a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Does anyone second it? Second. Motion, uh, all those in favor of adjourning? Aye. 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 Everybody opposed? Anybody abstaining, please don't. Um, we are adjourned.